Hi, I'm Bran, and I love Hallmark movies. Hey, I'm Panda, and I like Hallmark movies. I'm Dan, and I despise Hallmark movies. And I'm Ron Oliver, and I make them. And this is the Deck the Hallmark Podcast. Oh, good, good, good. You know what's fun is listening to Deck the Halls in June. It yep. is. Isn't it so much fun? It doesn't get fun? old, I can tell It doesn't you get old. It's not for me anyway. It's like watching these movies. They're uh, own, they're all their own little snowflakes. They are their own little snowflakes. I say, that, that is very sweet of you to say that. They all look the same, band. but they're each individual in their own way. That's exactly right. You know who makes them the most individual? Ron Oliver. He does. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well the, well, the good news is is Ron is uh, Ron's with us today. Um, Ron, first of all, hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's nine thirty in the morning uh, as we're doing this here in Hollywood, and um, it's entirely possible that I was at the Magic Castle last night, which is our private club for magicians only, and <laughs> there may have been martinis involved. No, so I'm a little fuzzy. <laughs> I hope it's understood. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do magic. Oh yes, that's. I was a magician from childhood. That's. Um, it's always been my avocation, if you will. Do wow. You, do you? Could you do something for us right now? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> do you have a stage name, Ron? Do you have like the great Ron? Yeah, Ron Oliver, actually. Is the <laughs> I, I I used to do a big show. I did like floating ladies and sawing people into three pieces and all that sort of thing. And um, I, you know, I I did it for a long time, and then uh, I started writing, and then I I got into this business. So. Wow. So what's but your most keep, impressive I illusion? I keep, I keep my hand in it. I still go to the Magic Castle. I'm a proud member there for 20 years, magician member. And um, so I still touch into it a little while. Did you get any kick out of Arrested Development when they did Job being a magician? I'm sure you've seen it. Now I'm just... I did. I wasn't a fan. I'm not an un- unfan, but I, didn't, I did, didn't watch the show that much. But I have a friend who loved that show. And would tell me all about it. And I saw a couple episodes with him as the magician. He he, he pretty much nailed it. <laughs> the, the magician's alliance is my favorite part of that. Like they take yeah. themselves so seriously. It's great. <laughs> it. um, well, Ron, what people might not know is that we've done this before about two months ago. And um, <laughs> just ruined it, it was. Um, no. Well, here's what happened. I was really bad that day. <laughs> I, I threw up everywhere. It was disgusting. Uh, it was wow. disgusting, and so we couldn't use that take. And Ron was kind enough to uh, – it took a lot of convincing, a lot of uh, <laughs> money under the table. But Ron uh, is back with us. And it and it works out well because Ron has a new movie coming out, uh, I believe, next week. Next so week. Wow. We'll talk about that. Uh, but Ron, tell everybody uh, – it, it, maybe maybe nobody knows who you are. They don't know the movies that you've done. Tell everybody uh, if, if you were giving a pitch on yourself, how would you pitch yourself? Who, who are you? Well, my name is Ron. Um, I, uh, I, my very first movie was a horror film called Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. Which, uh, <laughs> my, my very first review was um, uh, it's the blue velvet of high school horror movies. <laughs> so that was a nice way in. And uh, then I did um, Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps and all these shows that I now have crew members coming up to me and saying, you terrified me when I was nine years old. <laughs> so uh, I did all of those shows and then I started making movies again and just uh, did that and did a, you know some thrillers and some mysteries and so forth. And uh, I did a thing for Warner Brothers, uh, then it's The Menace Christmas, which sort of started me on this Christmas movie mm-hmm. tangent. And uh, now I'd say... Probably, I'd probably do one or two Christmas movies a year. I'll write one and then write and direct another one. And so uh, right now we're doing these Hallmark Christmas pictures, which have become big business the last few years. Um, and I've done a couple of the Hall of Fame movies. One was right. called The Christmas Train, which got very big numbers for them. So I was very popular around the office for a few days. <laughs> um, and last year's Hall of Fame was called Christmas Everlasting, which was very well received. I did some, I wrote, so co-wrote um, something called Operation Christmas that got some awards. And so uh, that's what I do. And, and right now I, I did um, uh, a movie called Granddaddy Daycare last summer that mm. came out for Universal. Um, uh, Big Fat Liar, uh, the sequels to those. I'm writing one right now, one of those sequels. Um, so it's, uh, you know, hey, it's good to be me. I get to work all the time and do something I love. That's right. So it's great. Fantastic. Now, I know a lot of people care about the Hallmark movies, but really quick, you said you did Goosebumps. <laughs> What episodes of Goosebumps are you responsible for? Do you know? 
A lot of them? He's got to know. Uh, I would say of the five seasons of Goosebumps, I wrote or directed probably maybe 20 of the episodes out of those wow, five seasons. this guy. And I produced uh, the final season. We did four two-parters, and I produced those as well. So, so thank you. First of all, thank you. I mean, thank you for doing it. <laughs> it's a big deal for Bran. Uh, Ron, so... The show, man. We had so much fun doing that thing. Oh, my gosh. It was great. And then they did the Goosebumps. I just saw the Steins, Bob and Jane Stein, R.L. Stein. Just saw them in New York a few weeks ago, actually. Wow. That's awesome. Legend. Legend. Um, yeah. So, Ron, the last two years, you've been responsible for the Hallmark Hall of Fame film, uh, which you mentioned... How do you how do you become that guy? The go to Hallmark like it seems like you're the heavy hitter director when Hallmark's got the the big actors coming in or their kind of their premier movie. Like how did you like how did you work your way into that? Do they just you know how that how that go? Damn if I know. You know what it is? It's um, if you just stick around long enough, if you just keep doing something long enough, eventually they just give in. It's more my career is more one of attrition. <laughs> um, they, uh, uh, you know, I've been really lucky and I've surrounded myself, I think smartly with really talented people and they make me look good. So I have a, a great team, um, uh, crew that I hire frequently, the same crew people often. Um, and the actors, many of them are, are people that I know well, so I get to work with people again and again. And, and, and as to answer the question, I think it's just that. Um, a few of the movies that I've done have done well for them and, and uh, they've come together well. So the network trusts me um, to when they're putting a little more money into something, which is to say a bigger cast and so forth, they trust me to, uh, to work with them. I mean, there are some very, very gifted and talented writers and directors working for the Hallmark um, brand these days. We're, we're really fortunate to have great people and uh, I'm just one of them. And I just, I got lucky a couple of times. Wow. Well, um, we always hear every time we talk to anybody that works for Hallmark or with Hallmark that everybody that works there is wonderful and that's all well and good. We also hear that there's a very specific formula. There's a very specific amount of control. They'll take scripts that people write and they'll Hallmark them up, so to speak. Um, but it seems like you have a little bit more freedom and creative expression on set. Like, is that accurate or are you still following a pretty, pretty locked in Hallmark script? You know, that's a good question. Um, they, Hallmark definitely has its brand, you know, and part of that is they know what the audience likes and what they respond to, but the audience is smart. They still want to be surprised. So they don't want to feel like it's rope. And you can tell when, when a movie is, has come together that maybe just is predictable, the audience responds to that and they will, they will say, no, no, that was just boring or that was whatever. Um, and they will respond in a way. So they're aware of the fact that you have to keep the brand fresh all the time. And, and um, I'm given latitude, I would say, certainly. The, the movie we just finished, we'll talk about later, but they gave me a great deal of freedom on that. And, and to be honest, they, they generally do because they trust me to know the brand itself and to know that the, the parameters of the brand are such that you just want people to feel good. I mean, that's, if there's any bottom line to it, you want people to come away from it feeling happy and not feeling like, like the world is about to end and there's sadness and grimness because that's around you and people want to feel good. And so they trust me to know what pieces of the puzzle put together to make people feel good when the movie's on. So how do you go about personally when you start getting ready to direct these films or whatever uh, to inject that level of freshness in one of these films? Like you do have this boundary, but like how do you – like get that creative input to me, I'd run out puzzle pieces really quickly, but you don't, uh, how do you manage to put them together in new ways? Like wh what's your strategy for that? You know, the, uh, honestly, that's another great question. The, how that strategy works. I live life hmm. <laughs> and every experience I have, and this is going to sound so Pollyanna, I should be taken up back and shot. But <laughs> it, it, I, you just, if you uh, embrace the things around you and bring it in and don't, steal yourself off from everything. Um, it's amazing the life experience stuff that you can bring to the table when you're making a movie. Just again, I don't want to jump into the next picture yet, but the, uh, the movie we just finished, um, it's called picture perfect mystery. And, uh, I read the script. They sent me the script to read and it was, you know, it's a murder mystery. I had a choice of two pictures. I could go to Paris and do this movie about a wine competition in Paris. Oh, it just came out last month. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I could have, <laughs> or I could have gone to Vancouver and did this murder mystery. And I read. I was all ready to go to Paris, and then I read the murder script, and I thought, you know, I really want to do a mystery. So I stayed and went up to Vancouver and did the movie. The, 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 hold on a second. 
He's a busy guy, Ron Oliver. The fact so that we. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so I ended up doing that, and uh, I when I was flying up to Vancouver, I was listening to um, some bossa nova music, and I thought '60s bossa nova. That's the movie. So we got to Vancouver, and the first thing I said to my production designer was. Um, give me a logo that looks like a Hitchcock Saul Bass kind of thing. And we're going to use it on the wall. And that's the inspiration for this movie. Mm-hmm. And then we brought in the Bossa Nova. And then the movie itself looks like if Breakfast at Tiffany's had a murder in the middle of it, that's the movie. And that all came about just because I was listening to music on the flight up and I was feeling it. And I thought, yeah, I'll bring that in. And they gave me all this freedom to do that. Wow. And that's the same with the, with the Christmas pictures the same way, really, because, it, you know, if it's something I've listened to or something happened in my life or you know, whatever on, on Christmas everlasting last year, my mom had just passed away and I lost my dog all in the same time. Oh my so goodness. It was, yeah, it was like a bam, bam punch. And it was really, it was hard. And I thought, well, let me bring some of that emotion into this. And so in the script itself and with the actors, the performances, you know, the trick with that is to make sure it doesn't become like this sort of grim march to the graveyard. You know? <laughs> um, but, but like I put into that movie, um, the Nat King Cole music, the mm. network, yeah. for me to use because my mom loved that King Cole. Oh. So I used that in the movie as an inspiration. And so that's, it kept it fresh for me. And I think it keeps it fresh for the audience. So, you know what, Ron, I did not know that about your mom, but I can tell you this right now that that's the only Hallmark movie I've watched that evoked some actual authentic emotion for me. Like it really like legit, like you could feel that that movie had a soul underneath it. Um, and it, it didn't play by all, like there was some actual loss, yeah. like in all these Hallmark movies, there's no real loss. Like maybe in the murder mystery ones, there's some loss, <laughs> but like in the Christmas movies, like everything always works out. Well, this is this Christmas everlasting showed the beauty in the ashes. Like they had to move on, but they could have a bigger family and they could include, and they could open their doors up. And I like, that was the one you've, you have made. And so this is a backhanded compliment. You have made my favorite and probably my least favorite Hallmark movie uh, in Truly Madly Sweetly. So, like, somewhere, all of the rest of them live somewhere in between those two foul poles. <laughs> Truly Madly Sweetly was almost a documentary, when you think about it. Um, yeah, I, I get that. Um, and I, I thank you for that comment. I appreciate it, because it was, and that movie was that. And everybody sort of came to the table. Um, knowing that I had just gone through this thing and they were really um, supportive. And there, I think there was, I think there was a, a real sense that we're doing something special here. So yeah. maybe you can give some insight onto this. You know, there, the once, once a year at Christmas time, we get these hall of fame movies and mm-hmm. they, they are still hallmark, but they're kind of at a different level. Um, what, what is hallmarks thought process behind one? How do they choose the movie? That's going to be the hall of fame movie, but two, mm-hmm why not make them all hall of fame movies? <laughs> I can answer that real easy. Um, uh, first of all, budgetarily speaking, they, yeah, there you go. They couldn't <laughs> afford to do it. I mean, our budget for uh, Christmas everlasting was almost three times the budget we had for truly Maddie Sweetie. Wow. wow. Well, well that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, we put a lot of work into those fake fall leaves. Um, <laughs> what and, about the cupcakes? Uh, and uh, uh, no, that's a big part of it. How they choose them is interesting because it, like Christmas Everlasting, it was right down to the wire. They hadn't found one yet. Mm. And it was a very, um, uh, I think they went through three or four different things trying to find the right movie that they wanted it to be. And it was very difficult. Usually the the um, the Hall family, the, the, the big folks at the Hallmark, they are very hands-on with the Hall of Fame films because oh. they have a legacy for them. So they, they keep an eye on that stuff. So they're involved in the, in the, the uh, thought process for how to choose it. Um, Christmas Train, the one we did the year before, was based on uh, David Baldacci's book that a producer friend of mine, Karen Spiegel, brought to the network and said, let's do this. And it was a best-selling book, had been for years, and it was a <clears throat> kind of a no-brainer for Hallmark to go, yeah, this is a great book, and here's our story. And Christmas Train, you know, oh. German, when we did that movie, Dermot Mulroney said, um, how could I say no? It's a train, a Christmas. Come on, boom, movie writes itself. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, we've got questions about the Christmas Train. I love the Christmas Train. That's probably top five for me, too, yeah. Christmas Train. How is it, like, there's clearly a bigger cast in Christmas Train, not only in quantity, but also in, like, quality, at least from, a, like, an A or B list kind of thing. You got Danny Glover, you got Dermot Moroney, or Dylan McDermott, one of them, uh, and you've got, uh, you know, all these, all these, you know, you've got these big names, 
is is it just a different feel on set? Is, is it different that you know more just, pressure? Yeah, yeah, just tell me tell me a little about that because like the quality of that work is like the ending is preposterous to that film and and it's hilarious and we we all, I also want to talk about Kenny. There's a lot I want to talk about, but just working with actors of that level that are normally used to doing things a little bit bigger than Hallmark. What's that like? Um, and that's a, another great question, guys. Um, that one, um, specifically Christmas train, you've got actors who are, you know, for want of a better word, legendary and people who come in and they're used to a big budget picture, let's say, but the way the business is going to last, I'd say decade. Um, everybody's getting it, the tightening their belt budget wise and understand this is, you know, this is where we are now. So most of them have a really good attitude. Um, there was no tension on set particularly because they're all actors are all just actors, you know, and even the really famous ones, sometimes you get somebody pompous, but anybody who's really great comes in ready to work and ready to put the time in. And, and they're amazing. You know, the, the idea that uh, when you're doing a close up of somebody, um, the other actor will stand off camera and di- deliver dialogue so they can do the back and forth. And there are some actors who will not stand off camera. They're not on camera. They don't bother going there. But every single one of the names I've worked with in my career um, have been more than happy to stand off camera and do dialogue for their fellow actors because they're still actors at the end of it. So I wouldn't say this this tension. There's, there's an awareness that there's a lot of money being spent. So there are certain, you know, let's say proper trailers, you know, like like nice nice trailers and things like that. Of course. Um, but oh. no, it, it, it's just, it's still make you're making a movie and everybody's in it together. Is, so we hear it's, that Hallmark's kept this thing down to a science where all these movies are 15 day shoots. Was Christmas train a 15 day shoot? No, Christmas train was 22 days. Okay. So an extra week. Is that true for all the Hallmark, uh, hall of fame movies? Uh, yeah, they tend to have an extra, we did Christmas everlasting in Atlanta and I believe it was 20 days. Okay, so like an extra extra work week, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah. C- can you tell me about the? We have a thing around here called the Kenny verse, where we believe that Kenny, the character in these Ron Oliver films, who also pops up in some others, he exists across the Hallmark universe. And no matter if it's a time travel movie, or if it's a Santa movie, or if it's just a movie about a good old fashioned bartender on a Christmas train, Kenny is around. Like he he's is omnipresent. He's omnipresent <laughs> and he's making drinks that don't make any sense and it's wonderful. Like, tell me, can you give me a little insight? Since every time I see Kenny, I, oh, that's perfect. Is, Kenny. If you're watching live, you got a picture of Ron and Kenny both in Hawaiian shirts. So <laughs> I can't believe I missed that party in all honesty. <laughs> I'm a little sad I wasn't um, there. Tell us about Kenny and why he's the best. <laughs> So uh, I told him this story back when we talked before, and you can't imagine the size of the grin on his face. Um, he, uh, uh, well, Kenny uh, played a, a three or four line part in a movie I did years ago called, um, uh, oh my gosh, oh, Third Man Out. And it was a, uh, it was a Donald Strachey mystery series, and it was based on a book series. And it was essentially The Thin Man, except husbands. So two gay okay. guys who were married, and they, they saw mystery. Huh. And so there's a scene where Kenny uh, Nelson uh, played this scene, and he was so funny, and I had never met him before. And he comes in, and he was so funny. I thought, okay, this guy's going to be in every movie I do. <laughs> so his name is Kenny Kwan. So now he's been, he was in all four of those movies, and I've just kept it going. And in every movie that I do, there's a character, and there's always some support character guy. Who's, you go, oh, that's that guy. That, that's the Kenny Kwan part. And the scripts will come in, and I'll go, mm, oh, there it is. Change the name to Kenny Kwan, cast Nelson, put him in. And now it's become a thing that it's not just my movies. And this is across the board. We, um, Big Fat Liar 2, he was in there, Kenny Kwan. Wow. Uh, um, I think even in Beethoven we did. Um, but So he's all over the place. And now there are other directors will do it, other Hallmark directors. That's there was fantastic. a movie last year that I co-wrote called Hope at Christmas. Yeah. And he's in there. And I was going to direct it, and then I did the other one instead. And the script still had Kenny's name in it. So they go up there and I, I know the director and I said, look, I, I did that. I was going to do a thing with Kenny, but you don't have to do that. Don't he goes, no, you're kidding. This is gospel. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so so in that one too. whenever you get signed on for another Hallmark movie, do they just go ahead and put Kenny in the budget? Like, is that part of the deal? <laughs> it's our line item now on the budget. Yeah, uh, it's very funny. Our, our big, uh, uh, one of our big executives, Randy Pope, who's, um, uh, the big muckety muck of the network. He, um, and a, and a dear friend, actually, he um, uh, now he just asked. 
He says, okay, so uh, what's the Nelson part? Where, where's, where's Kenny showing up in this one? And <laughs> I sort of assume he's going to be there. So I'm, I'm already great. excited. I'm excited that. about this uh, Pena Vega film because now I know Kenny's going to be there somewhere, and I'm ready. I'm ready for it. He is. But <laughs> he also a, in 20 well, years. I won't tell you what he does, but he, he actually uh, helps to solve the mystery. Okay, Whoa. good. In 20 years, I'm looking forward to sitting down with Kenny for like an Inside the Actor Studio. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the things we do on our show is called, uh, what the hallmark where we kind of wonder, uh, we, we maybe didn't get the answers that we wanted to, to kind of sum up things. Maybe it's something that happened before the movie or after me that would help give some clarity. Okay. Um, one of, one of the things that we just, as we watched the Christmas train that we couldn't figure out is how in the world, the train <laughs> was just, safe. Was safe. Was it the horse? Did the horse pull the train? <laughs> There's a one there, horse for those, sit- for those that haven't seen the movie, the train gets stuck by the snow and, uh, the, the two main characters go out and they come back on a horse drawn sleigh. And then next thing you know, they're, they're There's, at they're the train home. station. They're, yeah. So, so what happens, maybe you can give some clarity to how they actually got to the train station. Well, um, <laughs> they, they get to the train station much in the same way that, um, Eva Marie Saint and Cary Grant go from the edge of the cliff, hanging up <laughs> with your life. To married life sometime later on board the train as they head off into the sun. Perfect. The Perfect. That's exactly how they happen to do that. And it's, uh, you know, there, there's part of it, it, it. It's a valid question, though, because some of it you do. Well, this is our budget level. So how do I show this on this budget level? Well, you do it in a cut. It's real simple. And that's why cinema is still the greatest art form. Right. Because you can do things in a cut or in a close up or in whatever that will actually propel your story along. The original draft of the script had the train stuck in a cave and, or no, stuck in the thing. And then they all went into a cave and we we're looking for tunnels or like a, like a train tunnel. And we we're looking around locations, scouting for train tunnels and all this stuff. I said, does anybody here really want to spend three days inside some dank, nasty tunnel in Burnaby, <laughs> BC? I don't. Let's just stay on the soundstage and they're stuck on the train. I mean, it's as simple as that. And the truth is we spoke to the Amtrak people quite a lot about that movie. And they said they would never get off the train. In a situation like that, the train is stuck. They wouldn't let them off the train. Yeah. Ron, so. Ron, you 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 sold us with North by Northwest. Stop selling, yeah. man. You <laughs> sold us. You, you already <laughs> sold it. You didn't like. It's one of the best movies always of all go time. To Mr. Hitchcock. When in doubt, always go to Mr. Hitchcock. That's right. I love, love it. And then uh, in Christmas Everlasting, one of our big things that we were just curious is: Does uh, the main guy? I don't remember his name, but does he live in that ice hut, or, yeah. or is he just kind of hanging? Got the best ice fishing hut, or is it it's just like a, a really nice clubhouse? What, what's his deal you. there? Let me tell you. Let me tell you about those ice huts because we checked those out to see in, the, in Wisconsin. We checked out what kind of these things, what they look like. Yeah, his was actually less furnished than some of the ones we saw. Wow! wow. Literally. Move out there. I mean, to, to me, I'm in California. I don't, what do I know from ice? Except in the Martini uh, Of course. <laughs> but but um, in Wisconsin, on the lakes, um, it freezes so hard and it'll last for quite some time. They build these huts out there. They move them out. And they're beautifully done. And they have televisions and satellite TV and all this stuff. It's crazy how invested they are in their ice huts. And there. here you are so. filming ice huts in Atlanta. And that's got to be a blast. <laughs> we shot them in uh, Tyler Perry's one of Tyler Perry's studios against green screen. And then wow. The whole thing. That's fantastic. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, going back to the Christmas train, uh, this twist ending, uh, mm. how much time was put into like, it's such a weird reveal. Like it's such a crazy, like how could he take three, three and a half actors? If you count Dermot Maroney's girlfriend, when she shows up, and make sure that everything else was staged exactly the way it should. Like needed a lot of help. Like what went into the storyboard of making this twist make sense, or at least keeping it uh, hidden so that audiences would enjoy it. Uh, well, it's actually that twist is in the book. And uh, so it came to it that way. The, the two writers, uh, Tippy and Neil, um, who wrote the original script, the, um, uh, they had the twist in there. And if you go back and watch the movie again, I dropped a couple of little things in here or there. Sure. So if you watch it a second time, you go, wait, now I see that that wasn't really the thing. And it's usually a, a look the actor will give or, or a pause or something. Um, but, uh, you know, it was all right there in the text, really. The script was pretty well constructed. And you sort of went, OK, this goes. And granted, um, it is a little bit of a stretch to believe that all of those things have to fall together in a certain order in order for the, the payoff to work. But then you just go back to Fincher's The Game, 
And <laughs> you say to yourself at the end of that, when Michael Douglas falls through the glass and he didn't die. Yeah. Okay, you know, so. Fincher's The so Game is my... Thing. It's, only a, it's only a movie, Tippy. Yeah. Only a movie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, let's talk about your upcoming movies coming out next week. Picture, picture perfect mysteries. Is that what that's it? Uh, with, with the, with the Pena Vegas. Is that correct as well? Love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, what can you tell Uh, us? What can you tell us about that movie? Why should we be tuning into this, uh, this mystery? What can you tell us? Uh, it's the first murder mystery I've done for the network. Um, and I try to bring something, you're talking about freshness. I try to bring something pretty fresh to it. Stylistically, it's a 1960s film huh. although it's said in 2019 obviously but it feels very the, the, the camera work and the structure of it, the whole thing um the look the color the palette all that stuff it's cool. it's very stylized it's one of the most stylized things i've ever done and the opening title sequence is so bass worthy i will say it's wow. gorgeous and all pastels and so forth um and the pen of Vegas, the two of them together she plays a photographer who's at a wedding taking pictures and somebody gets murdered at the wedding and uh, he's the detective who's assigned to the case. And, of course, and when they met, it was murder. Um, <laughs> they uh, basically play off each other beautifully, as you can imagine. They have great chemistry on screen. And this is the idea is this is the start of a series of movies for them. If it takes off the way they think, they've already ordered two sequels because they love the movie so much. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, we haven't even aired it yet. Wow. Um, so uh, they're... Um, they're great. And the cast is terrific. Some wonderful folks. Again, this was not a Hall of Fame movie. So we shot it in 15 days. Wow. We still have to like, because, you know, daddy likes I to mean, go home. Come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bro. Yeah, just, 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 <laughs> hit your mark. Say the words. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a very, very good film. I'm really proud of it. And it's, the music is dynamite. And it's all uh, like uh, Joel Bean kind of sound. It's all very um, Bossa Nova and uh, 60s cool and yeah. Pink Panther-esque. That's we awesome. have some Mancini stuff in it, that kind of feeling. So Man, I think people sweet. are going to like it because it's quite a bit different than anything we've done before. If you I, can evoke any, fun. if you can evoke any Hitchcock while I'm watching Hallmark, then you're you have succeeded you the day. in yeah. a level that oh, just, please. yeah. Oh, you'll see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how does it cut? You, you've done every possible type of Hallmark. You've done a you've done a standard Hallmark Channel movie. You've done the Hall of Fame, and now you've done a mystery. How are? I mean, obviously the Hallmark Hall of Fame is different. The feel we've talked about that, but is there any difference as far as the filming, as far as the how you go about it, as far as the feel on set between is 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 uh, the Hallmark uh, movies and mysteries? Do they uh, does Hallmark care about them as much as they care about the Hallmark Channel? Do you, do you get that kind of feeling from it? That's a good question. Again, you guys are nailing it today. I mean, um, we are professionals. <laughs> we were not at the Magic Castle last night, if no. you can believe it. And so it also helps when you've done it. This is the second time doing the interview. So we're, right. just, <laughs> <laughs> we're now All right, six, seven, eight. Um, uh, you know what? I will give the network a great deal of credit for this because they do care about these movies as much as they care about the Hall of Fame. And mm. I can speak to that because I've made all these different ones and the level of oversight and quality control is the same across the board. They don't um, they, they don't look at one any different than the other, and they're, they're very it's very good that way. Actually, I hadn't really thought of that before, but it's true. They they were as on top of us for Picture Perfect Mysteries as they were for Christmas Everlasting to make sure that the brand was on and that uh, and that the movie works. Because that's ultimately the real care of it is does the movie work? You know, oh, absolutely. That's what they ask, and even if it's slightly off brand, they still want to know if it works. Does it work to our audience? Does it work? Period. So, um, what's next in the pipeline for Ron Oliver? Do you, are you going to, we're going to see a Ron Oliver joint this Christmas or, or what? Uh, I suspect so. Yes. Um, we are in negotiations with a couple of places for Christmas movies set at Christmas at the, I don't want to say what they okay. are. Yet, so we know for sure, but, um, a couple of places that are near and dear to my heart and, uh, we're looking at those, um, we are. I'm right now writing uh, Big Fat Liar three uh, because, as you know, there are so many unanswered questions in Big Fat Liar two. <laughs> I was on the edge and, of my seat. <laughs> and uh, and probably two more of our Picture Perfect mysteries back to back. By the sounds of it, they've got the scripts happening right now. So 
it will be another hectic uh, six month run to the roses to the end of the year and and uh, try to get our I'll get my Christmas movie squeezed in there somehow so we can uh, have it on the air by uh, end of November. And Ron, we love you, but this has really been a long ploy because our dream is to be Hallmark Extras. So yeah, next time fun. you think about... Uh, well, I we're think, right here. I think for us to be extras in Christmas at Magic Castle would just be <laughs> a dream come true. <laughs> He's thinking... <laughs> well, is there is there anybody amongst the three of you who with a little bit of, say, like a white hair, white beard, white mustache kind of that's, treatment could look like Santa Claus. That, that's Let's me. See. I'm, I'm, uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like 280 pounds, Ron. Come on. I'm made for it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, Ron, this was so much fun. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, somehow it was more fun the second time than it was the first time. It was time. great. Yep. And You're... the first time was the best day of my life. And so <laughs> this too is the best, this day, too is the best day of my life. Uh, but Ron, tell people how they can uh, follow you, kind of see what you're up to. Um, and kind of uh, get an inside on scoop on media, you. you say. Yeah, on the social media. Social media. Well, I am on Instagram and I am on Facebook. And you just type my name in and you can find me. Fantastic. Super. Thanks so much for joining us, Ron. You just give us to give us this amount of time. We really do appreciate You're it. You're a delight. And may we be the first to tell you Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.